Everybody can see all that, yeah. Yeah. Everybody can hear everything and everybody can see everything. So, yeah. Are we live? We're live now. So we've got six attendees. But I muted them, so yeah, Sharon just let you can hear. That's great. So you can do a message saying we'll be starting momentarily. Share where they're from. Put the out there. That's a good one. Walk out. Good to see you. Let's go out. All right. All right. Where is it? Where is it? Is it the gamma? That's everybody. <laughs> it's just waiting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You can see me here, too, right? 
Yep. Ricky Mon. Yeah. Daisy Rodriguez from PA. I can hear all right. Thanks, Jill. Nice to tuned in. <laughs> and they can hear us, but we can't hear them. Power tech. I've got, yeah, I've got eight. There's eight of ten lines right now. Yeah. I just usually um, we'll take we'll take the lesser, the best teacher of all time. The best teacher of all time. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. And then like I said, as soon as you start to present, I'll just flip yeah. over the presentation here and I'll follow along so that it seems better that I can hear you. Good. We're good. I think we'll get started. So good evening to those of you who are joining us here at Don Talk. And to all of you who are joining us online, out in the ether, 
uh, in the region and beyond. Uh, for those of you who are joining us online, if you experience any technical difficulties, you know that it never happens when we're doing something you're doing like this. Um, if you do, please type us a message in the chat. We have someone who is monitoring things. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Kevin Main. I'm the head of school here at Bill Hop, and I'm thrilled that you're joining us for this great presentation. It's the first in our education series. Tonight's presenter may be a little familiar to many of you. He's been connected to Hilltop for many, many years and has been an invaluable resource to our faculty, our staff, our students, and to our families. Mike McLeod is a speech language pathologist, ADHD executive function specialist, and the owner of Grow Now ADHD. He's traveled the country and the world to that from North Carolina, where he's been conducting trainings for schools, for staff, for parents, and most importantly for students. Uh, he has been introducing them to his Grow Now model of strengthening executive function. And tonight, he will be discussing strategies and techniques that can be used to enhance children's academic and personal growth and development, focusing on interpersonal relationships, and importantly, on meaningful experiences. So please welcome to the podium, Mike McLaughlin. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for coming tonight. I know the weather is treacherous out there, right? It's Thursday night, but you guys made it. But thank you so much, everyone joining on Zoom. Thank you guys, everybody. Thank you so much, Mr. Maine, for setting this up. Michelle, Sarah King, everybody here at Hilltop. Uh, as Kevin said, I've been a part of the Hilltop family since I think like 2016, I think. And I call this place like a second home. As someone who part, at my organization partners with so many different schools within this region, I travel the country training different schools and different districts. And there is, I can tell you right now, obviously I'm biased, but there is no place like Hilltop Prep. Like what this school has done to not just simply be a school and build a community and work with the individual child, the staff here, Cindy Falcone and all the great amazing people here, uh, it's such a privilege to be a part of this organization and this, and this school. And, uh, and working here, working one-on-one -on -one with students and the teachers has been a highlight of my young career so far. Uh, so it's a, uh, this is probably like my fifth time speaking here now. Uh, and I'm really excited. I always love uh, interacting with everybody and sharing some great information. So of course tonight, uh, well, my name is Michael McLeod. I am the owner of Grow Now ADHD based out of the media and my website's Grow Now ADHD. And my goal for these presentations, of course, is a parent education series. Uh, so I'll be discussing a lot of home executive functioning, home strategies, dealing with some behaviors and parenting styles and some you know, research-based information. But in the beginning, I always like to talk about ADHD executive functioning and really dispelling a lot of the outdated research that's out there. It's really quite fascinating for years, decades, we looked at ADHD completely incorrectly. And these kids were sent to ineffective therapies that raised anxieties, so no progress, and it got to an uh, in ineffective tipping point for them. Uh, so presenting the new view on ADHD and the direction it's now going, what truly are executive functions. So we like to talk, I like to dive a little deep into you know, the background of this information. And yeah, we'll talk about executive functions, self-regulation, and talk about some great parenting tips out there. And we'll have some fun tonight. <laughs> Hope you'll have a cookie. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> so I always like to give a shout out to my daughter, Eden, for all the presentations. That's a very old picture of her. She's about to be two. And it's a very old picture of me. <laughs> So back to back there. Okay, so the model, the grow now model of executive functioning that we've created, this grow now model for strengthening executive functions and resiliency, took place during an entire school year uh, several years ago at the at Newtown Square at Stratford Friends School. So we worked with an entire grade level there for the entire year. And this year, with the help of Michelle Mincozy, we were able to implement that here as part of the Grown Out program during uh, uh, the social emotional uh, period. So that was very successful as well. But we did the actual research study at Stratford Friends School. 
Uh, I also love, love to run through my references and my sources in the beginning of the presentation because this ADHD executive function community is so small. It's such a small little niche, right? So I like to give shout out to these people because if anything I say today sparks your interest, I highly recommend you look for these people. Uh, the first is Sarah Ward, who is a fellow speech and language pathologist. A lot of the work she's done in the field of ADHD and executive functions, uh, her treatment program for executive functioning has really become like a gold savior. She's amazing. You can find her at efpractice.com. She does lots of lectures. She's on lots of podcasts. Uh, but definitely check her out. Her work is amazing. She's based out of uh, Mass General Hospital. Uh, Dr. Russell Barkley, the absolute worldwide leader on ADHD. You guys have heard of Dr. Russell Barkley. Amazing, written hundreds of research papers, amazing parenting books. Uh, he is, you can find some of his lectures on YouTube. He is second to none. He had a twin brother with ADHD who passed away in a car accident. Uh, and he's just devoted his entire life to this field. Absolutely brilliant man. Uh, a good friend of mine, Ryan Wexelblatt, the ADHD dude. Uh, and I will be starting a podcast soon, uh, the Parenting ADHD Podcast. Really excited about that. Uh, he has a parent membership site I'll talk about later uh, <laughs> that I suggest a lot of parents utilize and use. He's always updating it and doing lectures and office hours. He's really incredible. He has these dude talk videos on YouTube that are for kids and teens with ADHD to watch, to learn about how their brain works. Lots of great parenting YouTube videos. His content is tremendous. And when I'm talking about this most recent research on executive function that's been out there that has misspelled a lot of the research and misconception, it's really coming out of the Harvard Center of the Developing Child. The work that they're doing in this field right now is groundbreaking. Everything they're learning about the prefrontal cortex, the brain, networks, how we develop executive functions through experiences and relationships, which we'll talk about today. Uh, they're doing incredible work on the research side of things. And I always like to remind parents about CHAT. CHAT is the local, uh, is a national nonprofit. Uh, there's a mainline CHAT, a Philadelphia CHAT, a Delaware County CHAT, a Chester County CHAT. They do parent support groups, tons of free resources. So if you have a child with ADHD or executive functioning challenges, definitely check them out. They do a great job. They do, you know, job interview training for young adults. Uh, it's, it's a lot of different support groups and social groups. Uh, so definitely check them out as well. Okay. So obviously you've heard me use the term ADHD and executive functioning pretty much hand in hand. And we'll get into that even deeper. So what are executive functions? Let's dive deeper into this. Okay, so we know that executive function skills are the skills they have been identified as the skills that all children and adolescents need to negotiate the demands of life. These are crucial life independent skills. These are the greatest predictor of lifelong success that we have, executive functioning skills. Okay, and they become even more critical as kids get older and they're looking for their independence and parents fade back. So as the decreasing parental supervision comes, we want it to be correlated. Decreasing parental supervision, increase in executive function skills, okay? So in terms of that, as kids get older, we want stronger executive function skills, and that's exactly how the brain develops. The brain develops from back to front, so that prefrontal cortex, that front part of the brain, is the last to develop. And it's not fully developed until around between 25 and 30 years old. And it takes those vast, varied experiences, interpersonal relationships, challenge, getting out of your comfort zone, that really creates the myelination and the neural connections within that prefrontal cortex. Uh, so it's really fascinating about what can be done during the puberty years, adolescence, young childhood, free play, all the things that really strengthen that prefrontal cortex and get it communicating with the other neural networks of the brain. So uh, if your child is below 20 years old, this is that prime time to really strengthen these skills. And like I said before, with the research we now have, there is no better time than now 
to get your kid or your child or your loved one uh, the help that they need to really strengthen these crucial skills. So in terms of executive dysfunction, lagging executive function skills, what do lagging executive function skills look like, right? So looking at this list, how many of these kind of hit home a little bit? <laughs> All of them, any of them, some of them, right? Excess papers and garbage in backpack and folders. <laughs> Your kids come home sometime, backpack because the paper is all over the place, and you try to pull them out and say, throw this out. They say, no, I need it. I need to take it. Right? Waiting until the last minute to get large tasks started. Does homework, but does not turn it in. That sounds familiar. That's so perplexing, isn't it? You did the work, but you didn't turn it in. That's, that's such a fascinating phenomenon happening, right? Does homework in the opposite order than they actually should? Starting with the most difficult and transitioning down to the easiest, some of the things that we may have done naturally as kids that they don't find uh, uh, easy to do. Things tasks will take much longer than they really do. This one math worksheet that's going to take hours, we'll have no time for anything, right? That time blindness that we'll talk about. And a really important one is every day looks the same for them. They go to school, they come home, they stay home, right? Does that sound familiar? When we were kids, it was life kind of like that? Weren't we kind of doing different things every day? Weren't we kind of going out, riding bikes, and going to the park, and going outside? Now it's a lot of go to school, come home, find the Xbox, find the phone, find the PlayStation, find Fortnite, find Minecraft, and kind of just be there. And there's really no diversity in their days, right? They have their small little comfort zone, which nine times out of 10, 10 times out of 10 is screen-based, right? They find that comfort zone and they want that comfort zone every single day, don't they? They don't want diversity. They don't want novelty. They don't want challenge. They don't want change. They want every day to look the same, which, which creates a lack of diverse social experiences, right? So this is just a general idea of some things that, you know, as we go through this presentation tonight, start to think, okay, I noticed that now. That makes sense. I see that in my child, right? So like I said before, executive functions, we now know, are the greatest predictor of lifelong success that we have, period. Individuals with strong executive functioning skills, the data shows us, the longitudinal studies show us, these are the ones that go on to gain meaningful careers. They are able to buy a house, stay in a house, rent, whatever the market looks like these days, right? They're able to find employment, keep employment, make relationships, keep friends, get married, have kids, and live an independent life. That's executive functions, a greater predictor of success than IQ. And all of these, all of these IQ tests that we do, all of these standardized tests that we do, all of these keystone tests, that would be the SATs, the ACTs, all of these things that we do, all the crazy testing that we have in the American style of education, really only happening here, right? It's really executive functions that are the most important skills. And how often are executive functions a part of overall education? How much are executive functions part of the training to become an educator or to become a worker in a school, right? Getting your master's degree in education, you might spend a couple of days a week talking about executive functions, right? The trouble with executive functioning is it's very hard to measure these skills. And in the American style of education, based on IDEA, race to the top, no child left behind, all the uh, political things that have been gained, uh, that have been passed for uh, education, it's all about scores, 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 right? Everything has to be scores. Every kid needs a label, a standard deviation, a standard score, a percentile ranking, a ranking, an age equivalence, right? Everything is obsessive, but that will never happen with executive functions, and we're going to talk about that. So the fact that we can't measure executive function skills, that means that there's no massive corporation that can create a super expensive test to measure the skill. Let's be honest, it's all, it's all based in money, right? Why focus on executive functions in schools? When there's no way to profit behind it, there's no way for Pearson or Lingua Systems or whoever it may be to make a test and create different things 
to measure these skills. We're never going to be able to truly measure executive functions because it's basically your imagination. And we'll dive deep into that. So getting even more specific into what the true predictors of success are. And of course, subject, success is subjective, right? Success, success looks different for every unique individual, for every different family, every different culture. Success is different for each person. But all of the research out there shows us, and there's been some groundbreaking, long longitudinal research on what are the true predictors of success. And there's really three main things that come up time and time again. Anyone have any guesses on what those things are? We have a small crowd, let's get live, people, right? Executive functions. executive functions, okay, a little bit deeper. What about, what about executive functions? What are the true predictors of success? What do you guys think? To say anything. Flexibility. Flexibility. Huh? Relationships, communication. Relationships and communication. Okay, excellent. Number one, independently forming and maintaining social relationships. And the key word there is maintaining. So the ability to form social relationships with peers outside of the family dynamic and maintaining those relationships is a great predictor of success. When you have the ability to use your perspective taking skills, your situational awareness, your social reciprocity, your social relatedness, and you're able to maintain friendships over time. This isn't the friend that you put the headset on and play Fortnite with. This isn't the friend that you play Minecraft with for a couple of hours. This is a friend that you build an actual interpersonal relationship with, where you care about them, you check in on them, you share ideas with them, you don't dominate conversations with them. You don't only talk about YouTube videos or memes, right? These are real relationships that you build and that really builds overall self-worth and self-confidence. The more social relationships, the more deep social relationships we're able to build. And actually it's not so much about quantity, it's about quality, the quality of those relationships, right? So that's a huge predictor of success. The next is the ability to independently manage your emotions. So this isn't just holding your emotions in and quelling your emotions and not, you know, not really feeling the emotions. This is just being able to manage them, not allowing your emotions to get the best of you, whether it's those anxious feelings of constantly banging over the thing, or whether you, you know, you have a boss who is really angry, who is really mean, and you freak out at work and yell at your boss, right? Or yell at your parents. The ability to manage your emotions and internally have a system of checks and balances. And internally have a, have a system where you can manage your emotions to respond as your best self, have a safety plan, recognize, have self-awareness that you're having heightened emotions, take a break, and then respond later. That takes executive functioning skills, right? We all have big emotions. We all have stress. We all have anxiety. But if we find ways to manage those emotions, that's a big predictor of success. And the next is the ability to, in, to manage your life and independently problem solve. So when you're living on your own and you got to figure out, okay, I have to get, I have to go grocery shopping, but I have a million other things to do. There's construction on the way, there's traffic. I'm not going to be able to make it today. Maybe I can go tomorrow on the way to the gym. Uh, maybe I can, you know, on my way to the friend's house, I can also stop at the post office and I can get all my grocery shopping done. And there you go. The ability to figure those things out, the things that all you parents do so beautifully every day, the way you manage your families and all of your kids, all those things we do internally beautifully. Sometimes we feel like we're failing, but we're managing our lives and we're figuring things out, right? All your families would fall apart without you guys, right? You guys are the glue, right? So all that independent problem solving is such a crucial part of success, okay? So now we can really dive deep into really what was happening in the past and what we now know in the future. So we are really, over the past five years, all of this groundbreaking research on ADHD and executive functions. So in the past, ADHD and executive functions were really looked at as this external behavioral based disorder, right? So we have these labels of attention deficit. They can't pay attention. Hyperactivity, hyperactive type. 
That kid can't sit still. Inattentive type. That kid can't focus. And everything's focused on external behaviors, which led these kids to being sent to ABA, right? Applied behavioral analysis. Some of these kids were sent to occupational therapy without, a sen without an additional uh, sensory diagnosis. And they were sent to, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy and uh, behavioral based therapy because every, everyone was focused on what they saw with their eyes, how this kid presented outward. They had an attention deficit, a deficit of attention, and it causes these external behaviors. And then we're looking at executive functions that also had a, had a heavy external focus, external organization. Can they organize their backpacks? Can they clean their rooms? Can they, can they use their agenda and create systems of time management? Can they create an ex, can they use their clocks and their alarms? And this led to this heavy focus on external ADHD, external executive functions, led to this rise of these executive function coaches, right? Where there is no certifying body, nobody claims you are an executive function coach. Literally anybody in the world can make a website and say, I'm an executive functioning coach. I'll work with your son for $200 an hour. And they'll sit with them and they'll organize their backpack, organize their papers in the, in the folders and sit with them while they work. Just hold them accountable, right? This is what majority of, I'm not going to speak for all of them, but the majority of what executive functioning coaches do. And we now know that none of that is helpful because what is it doing? It's keeping the kids prompt dependent on the coach. Because once that coach leaves, there are no skills gained. It's all about that coach being there physically within proximity, uh, make sure the kid is doing those things simply because the coach is there. So the coach leaves, you're right back at square one. So this actually got so bad in terms of the, the rise of executive functioning coaches, these kids being sent to ineffective therapies, that in many ways increased anxiety. And now we're seeing a massive increase in school refusal. Have you guys heard about that? So now more than ever, there's kids that are just straight up refusing to go to school. It's becoming a serious problem. They're going home, staying on the for the day. So school refusal is coming to be a big problem. And a lot of it was due to these kids not getting the help that they needed and the help that they deserved. And it got so bad that the American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC had to come out and say, we do not have any of these recommendations. We don't recommend ABA. We don't recommend OT unless there's other sensory things. We don't recommend CBT. We don't recommend DBT. We don't recommend talk therapy. We don't recommend psychotherapy. We, we recommend three things. Medication management for kids five and up, parent coaching, and very specific therapy that focuses on the internal skills strengthen the internal skills instead of just building up all of these accommodations. Because that's what these coaches are doing. They're providing accommodation. They're basically taking a 504 plan and bringing it home. And we all know 504 plans and IEDs go away at some point, right? So we need to focus on internal skill building. That all makes sense. And does all of this kind of look familiar? This is basically what was ha what was happening for kids with ADHD for so long. Who recognizes this clock? Right? There you go. There you go, right? And this is basically, you know, online propaganda for parents who need help, desperate parents who see their kids need help. Oh, buy this clock. That will that will teach your kid time management. Get this buzzer on their wrist. And uh, oh, there is an FDA approved video game that can improve your attention skills. You guys see that one? Yeah, exactly. These behavior charts, more uh, clip art morning charts, talking to Alexa, all of these different things that have been recommended to Alexa, set an alarm for me. All these different external systems that was built up for these kids that are not teaching them any skills, are not strengthening any internal skills. This is not helping. So now, we have a huge movement and a huge push in this field to completely even change the name of ADHD. So we now know that this disorder is not 
a disorder of attention. ADHD is not about attention, period. And it's definitely not an attention deficit. It's actually an abundance of attention. These kids have too much attention to give. They're responding to all of the stimuli in their environment, right? It's not an attention disorder. It's a performance disorder. The ability to show what you know at the point of performance. So many of these ADHD kiddos, these executive functioning kids, have such unbelievable intelligence and creativity, above average IQ, uh, average IQ, unbelievable strength and numbers and talents and drawing and all of those things. But when it comes to being at the point of performance in the natural environment and showing what you know, that's the problem. So it's not an attention deficit. It's definitely not hyperactivity. It's definitely not inattentiveness. ADHD is a disorder of executive functions. And there is a major push in this field to change the name ADHD to EFDD, Executive Functioning Developmental Delay. It is a three to five year delay in executive functions. Because this title ADHD is not helping these kids at all. You know, to the people that don't have the training, they hear ADHD. It's a, oh, he's lazy. Must be bad parenting. Get that kid a cup of coffee. He'll be fine. Right? We have to move on from this focus on attention, attention, sitting in attention. We have to recognize this is about executive functions. So now we're going to run through what the four pillars of EFDD are and then what the foundation of those are. Any questions about this at all? You're not saying the acronym is now that. <laughs> that might be the second the second or third time I've heard that. Uh, <laughs> pretty good. Yeah, that's uh there's a, yeah, there's a, there's been a lot of worse acronyms going on. So there's vast because for vast variable attention stimulus straight self-regulation deficit disorder. Um Someone even pushed for attention to the future disorder. <laughs> you know, so there's a lot of a lot of weird ones out there, but this is the one that is most likely sticking. But changing a name in the DSM is a lot harder than people in real life. Okay, so we're talking now. We're moving away from hyperactivity. We're moving away from inattentiveness. Number one, self-regulation. What is self-regulation? The ability to regulate your emotions your language, your body, your behavior in various environments towards various stimuli. It's not hyperactivity. It's not inattentiveness. It's an inability to self-regulate. Okay? Self-awareness. The ability to be aware of how you present yourself to others. The ability to be aware and perceive your environment. The ability to be aware of how, of what thoughts you're putting into other people's heads to be aware of your deficits, to be aware of what you're saying, what you're doing, so you're not just going with your first impulsive thought all the time. So this is where that impulsiveness come from, comes from. It's a lack of self-awareness. So they're always going with, with thought one, plan A. There's never a stop and think, okay, maybe I'll try this instead. The lack of self-awareness leads to that impulsiveness, okay? Self-motivation for non preferred tasks. Sound familiar? There you go. Self-motivation towards non preferred tasks. I can't tell you how many parents I'll, I'll mention self-motivation to, and the first thing they'll say is, no way. He'll play Minecraft for eight hours. There's no way he has a self-motivation problem, right? It is absolutely the inability to self-regulate towards something that is not instantly gratifying. So if there's a delay of gratification, or let me get let me get this homework done now, where I'm not gonna get a great job by my teacher until the next day, right? Or why study for this test now and I'm not gonna get it back graded until much later? Anytime there's that delay, motivation goes out the window and they're right back towards instant gratification. <clears throat> Self-evaluation, the ability to learn from past experiences and apply it to the present. So that inability to learn from the past and apply it to present situations, present environments, creates a serious issue with metacognition and self-evaluation. And this is why we tend to see them repeat the same mistakes over and over again, even after you've taken that phone away for a month 
or taking the video games for a way. They're not learning because they're not self evaluating, right? So the typical punishments really don't work for these kids, do they? Because of self evaluation. So these are the four pillars of ADHD and EFDD, and these are all founded upon self language, which we'll get into. So, so the all of these things come from a deficit in self language. Okay. And another really important thing to remember was that in the past, ADHD and executive functions were solely looked at as this academic based disorder. Okay. It's something that affects kids at school, affects them, that affects them with homework. It's something that is just school and academic based. Now we know no, this is a serious, a serious issue that affects them at home. And we'll be, we'll be talking a lot about home executive function today and dealing with behaviors in the home and also social executive functions. So what was seen as social skills for the longest period of time, which is now a pretty big no -no, now that we focused on the research and I was very anti neurodiversity and those kinds of things. Social skills is a pretty, pretty controversial topic now. It's really social executive functions. So a lot of those social skills groups that were so focused on eye contact and turn taking and topic maintenance and talking about non preferred topics that does not help an individual at all. In fact, it may increase their anxiety. When we teach them about perspective taking skills, situational awareness, social relatedness, uh, there's a lot of research that, that show that the typical structured social skills groups can actually make ADHD behaviors worse and can increase anxiety. So it's super important to really recognize what's happening in a social context. Is it focused on social pragmatic language, social skills, or social executive function? There's a big difference there. Excuse me. Yeah. Can you have this like manifest across like a broad range of kind of personal personality types? Like, can you have really strong kind of academic Absolutely. awareness, totally social, and and vice versa? Hundred percent. So ADHD, EFDD, or F, of course, is <laughs> is a spectrum disorder. It's, everyone's a snowflake, right? Every single individual is a unique individual. It's always going to be. You know, we have some of the kids who are, you know, angels at school. They come home and they tear the place up, right? We have kids that are amazing at home. They come to school and they're non-compliant the entire day, right? And you have some kids with ADHD that, that really struggle in, in school and in home, but are super social, really successful socially. So yeah, it happens, right? Cool. So what's really, really important is that we get an actual definition of what executive function skills are. Because you can read Smart but Scattered, right? You can read George McCloskey, you can read Dr. Russell Barkley, you can look at Sarah Ward. You can, no matter who you're reading, you're going to get a different definition of what executive function skills are. But most of the time, you're just going to get a list of what a, a list of the skills. So what's an executive function skill? Time management, organization, path initiation. That's not helpful, just a list. So I love Dr. Russell Barkley's definition of executive functions. This to me is the most spot on. So executive, so executive function skills are when an individual stops responding to the world around them and takes an action to the self. So this is a pose you'll see a lot of today. So it's all external to internal. Executive function skills are when you take an action to the self designed to change one's self to improve one's future, to attain a positive consequence or to avoid a negative consequence. So it's when we use our inhibition to stop that famous marshmallow test, right? We use our inhibition to stop. We don't respond to the external stimuli and we turn inward. And we do not go with our first impulsive thought. We don't go with our first emotional thought. We, we do that old vague phrase, stop and think. Really, it's stop and use your internal language. Stop and use your executive functions. So we stop, we take an action to the self, we aim our behavior, aim our thoughts toward the future, figure out what the future looks like, how we want it to look, and we change our behavior now to move towards that future. We become future thinkers when we use our AD, when we use our executive function. Does that make sense? Okay. 
So basically, executive functions are when we stop ourselves from what we would have done on impulse, that first impulse of thought without being self-aware, without self-evaluating, without self-regulating, without self-motivating, without talking to our brains and visualizing. We stop ourselves from what we would have done on impulse without stopping the thing. Okay? So that's really what's happening. Executive function is when you are stopping things. And of course, it's, it's quite probably going to be the biggest phrase of all time. We're going to dive deeper into what stopping things really means. But the ADHD brain is all about stimulus response. Stimulus response. There's a stimulus, let me respond. There's a stimulus, let me respond. Without stopping the thing. And what's the most stimulus response thing in the world? Screens. Video games, phone. This then this is exactly why the ADHD EFDD brain is so prone to screen addiction because they are so there's nothing, it's basically like gambling, like gambling, people who develop gambling addictions, stimulus response, stimulus response. It's the exact same thing. So, you know, there's many research that show that all of these screens that kids are growing up in nowadays is basically like gambling for kids because it's doing the same thing in the brain and giving them that dopamine drip constantly. And I've mentioned before, executive functions are just so hard to measure, which is why they don't find themselves in, in these skills in school. But this is how we measure executive function skills. So individuals with weak executive functions are going to find themselves very prompt dependent. They are reliant on the adults in their lives, the teachers in their lives, to be their prefrontal cortex, to be their executive functions. Constant prompts, constant reminders, constant visuals, constant back and forth, telling you what you need to do. Prompt dependent, where if you weren't prompting them, their life would completely fall apart. They wouldn't know what to do next. They'd be stuck in the moment, stuck in the now. So prompt dependence, reliance on others to independence. Prompt dependent on the world to independence. This is how we measure skills. So all the students that I see in my executive functioning therapy program it's not your typical IEP goals of, oh, he will master this skill with 90% accuracy over three consecutive sessions, all of that data, data, data that really doesn't get you anywhere, does it, right? If we have these goals where it's written as John will utilize a safety plan during periods of heightened emotion and dysregulation with fading prompts towards independence, right? Then we can actually start achieving some IEP goals because the focus is not on data, 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 what's happening here, what's happening there. It's all about transitioning from adults to the child. Are we actually focused on them using what's being taught outside of the environment? Think about all of the, all of the skills that kids work on in that one little room with the speech therapist, the OT, the counselor, whoever it may be. And what happens as soon as they walk out of that door? Right? The skills are gone. We're right back into stimulus response. But we have to focus on independence in the natural environment from prompt dependence itself. Okay? So when a child is prompt dependent, the adults are acting as a child executive function. And the longer this is done, the longer the development of these skills will be delayed. And we'll talk about different ways to kind of for parents to fade back and the kids step up. So obviously we're talking about, you know, different areas of EFDD and ADHD, but the research shows us that this can be a really debilitating disorder and delay. You know, when you look at the research, ADHD is highly correlated to substance abuse, job loss, divorce, uh, driving accidents, uh, early death in some, in some times. Uh, so if this is a really serious disorder, and Dr. Russell Barkley talks about this, his brother passed away in a car accident, he talks about how, you know, America and social media tends to uh, frame ADHD as the gift, as something that we need to trumpet and, uh, and, and, and really push up, which in many ways is true, you know, there, the neurodiversity uh, of it. But it is something that needs to be taken seriously in terms of uh, getting them the specific help that they need. You know, these kids can't waste their time doing ineffective therapies. You know, we need to use that amazing ADHD creativity, the amazing neurodivergent brain. How can we take the gift of it all and try to push as far away 
from the dangers that these things are also correlated in. And what does it all come from? So all of ADHD, EFDD, the foundation of it, the foundation of the disorder, remember, we're moving away from attention, we're moving away from hyperactivity, we're moving away from inattentiveness. It's all about a weakness and a disconnect in working memory. And when I mentioned self-language earlier, this is self-language. Nonverbal working memory and verbal working memory are the skill of internal language that we need to learn how to work together. So this is the ADHD brain. We have nonverbal working memory, verbal working memory, and these two these two skills are weakened and disconnected. In the uh, in in the strong executive functioning brain, these two systems are at the appropriate age level, working together in harmony. So nonverbal. All right. So nonverbal working memory is a fancy word for the visual imagery system of the brain, the ability to hold images in mind and manipulate them and create mental movies. And verbal working memory is the self-talk system, the ability to have an internal dialogue and talk to your brain. And we'll dive deeper into that. So nonverbal working memory is the visual imagery system of the brain, the movie theater of the brain. This is truly one of those unbelievably fascinating skills that truly separates humans from all other species. <laughs> Our ability to hold images in mind, manipulate them, remember them, is stronger than all other living species. Our ability to hold images in mind is so strong, we can literally bring back all of the senses because it all flows from that one image. You can make a mental movie of a dinner you had last week, two weeks ago, a month ago at a restaurant, and you can rehear the sounds of the restaurant, retaste the taste of the, taste of the food, refeel the texture of the napkin. You can bring back all of those senses. And most importantly, you can remember how that experience made you feel and what you learned from it. So this is unbelievably important. And in layman's term, this nonverbal working memory is really our hindsight and our foresight. We use our nonverbal working memory to learn from past experiences and apply it to the present. We can remember past struggles we've heard of your group. We can remember one time we got in trouble and what we learned from it. We can remember how we made a friend or we may have lost a friend. We can remember the past and apply it to the present so that we can learn from the past and build competence and confidence. And we can also use our foresight to visualize what we think the future may look like, okay? So that we can plan, prioritize, and problem solve all based on that image. And this skill right here, nonverbal working memory, all executive functioning starts with nonverbal working memory. There is no executive functioning without our ability to hold an image in mind and manipulate it. So like, for example, if you're sitting downstairs on the couch with your son or daughter, and you say, go upstairs and clean your room, if they don't visualize what their room looks like already when it's clean, visualize the end result, they're going to walk into that bedroom, what's going to happen? They're going to get distracted by the very first shiny object in their room, right? Nothing is going to happen. It has to be done up here first. They have to visualize what it looks like when it's clean so they can plan backwards and execute forwards. It all starts with a mental movie. We do this all the time. We're laying in bed, our alarm goes off. We do it in our head without even thinking. We think about, oh, I need to get up, make my coffee, take a shower, brush my teeth, get all my stuff together. If I get the car by 8, I get to work by 8.30, and I'll be okay. We do that in a matter of seconds. And it all starts with the mental movies. So the, the, the ability to create images in our mind is foundational to executive function. And then we have the self-talk system. So first we have mental movies and images, and then we have to be able to internally, privately, and silently talk to our brains based on those images. So with verbal working memory, we talk to ourselves. We call this the brain coach. 
internal privatized speech. And this all happens based on the Barclay Vygotskyan model led by Gotsky between the ages of five to seven. That's when language captures the motor system. So below five years of age, kids have some self talk, but it's all external. I mean, like, like think about a four year old. They'll talk to themselves, but you can hear it, you can measure it. You put a four year old to bed at night, they're talking, and there's nobody there, right? So around between the ages of five to seven, language captures the motor system, and all of a sudden you can do this. Face doesn't move, mouth doesn't move, but you can talk to your brain. And there's been fascinating studies where you put little electrodes all over your face and your larynx, and you silently talk to your brain, and those electrodes pick up the movements on your face and your larynx as if you're actually saying it out loud. It's the same system. Our ability to talk to our brain it is so unbelievably complex and unique. The ability to have a deep internal dialogue to self-motivate, self-direct, self-regulate is crucial to executive function. So it all starts with a mental image and then we talk to ourselves. So that right there is the foundation of executive functions. So we're asking ourselves, why is ADHD? Why is executive functioning developmental delay so debilitating? It's because of the weaknesses in these two things. So what does that then cause? If someone has weakened and disconnected visual imagery and self-talk, not working together in harmony, this is where these things come from, right? Time blindness, you guys all heard of time blindness with ADHD? That's exactly it. If we don't have the ability to re-image the past, forecast into the future, and really use those mental images, what happens? Kids get stuck in the now. They're stuck in the present moment. That's what time blindness is. An inability to learn from the past, an inability to forecast into the future and, and see what the future looks like so you know what to do now. They're stuck in the present moment. There's no internal clock. There's no sense of time passing. This is why they can sit down and say, I'm going to play games for 15 minutes. Five hours later, they're still on the video game. They're still on the screen. There's no sense of time passing, right? This is why they see a worksheet of math that has five problems on it. And they say, this is going to take five hours. I'm not doing that, right? Total lack of time, sensing time. And this is a really seriously debilitating part of ADHD because this basically, in many ways, makes it hard to be employable. It makes it hard to hold a job and keep a job and live independently. We have to be able to sense time, feel time. It's all part of independence. Our ability to track time overall. And another really big thing that happens is it creates a disconnect and a weakness in something called conditional thinking. Conditional thinking is basically if, then, cause and effect thinking. So understanding the concept of cause and effect. So basically that this issue of conditional thinking comes from the weakness in nonverbal and verbal working memory because it, they don't have the ability to say, okay, if the future looks like that visual imagery, then right now I need to do this self talk. So we're starting with visual imagery and, see, and thinking what something looks like. And then we're talking to ourselves to be mentally flexible with that picture. So the lack of cause and effect. And start to think of different ways you see this in your kid. They might say something that's hurtful to someone and they don't even recognize that it's hurtful. They might not want to do some work and they don't recognize the effect of if I don't study, if I don't do my work, it's going to affect my grade. If I don't text my friend back, they might have some negative thoughts about me. If I don't go do what my parents are asking, I might then get in trouble. The lack of cause and effect thinking is incredibly debilitating. And it all comes from the lack of visual imagery and self-talk. Any questions on that? That's feeling good. Along your mind. <laughs> a lot of information. Okay. So of course, as we move in, aside from all of the other issues with ADHD and executive functions, we've seen an increase in screen. In our daily lives, of course, this instant gratification world we live in. And we've also seen an increase in external behavior problems, dysregulation, executive functions, social skills. There's no doubt all schools across the country 
are reporting an increase in behaviors, uh, school refusals, uh, lack of work completion, decreasing grades. You know, of course, the pandemic and virtual school is to blame for that, of course. But a lot of it comes from a lot of issues with screens. And let's figure out what's happening with screens and why screens are affecting executive function development. And the first thing to remember is screens have become such a part of our daily lives. It basically has eliminated our opportunity to practice nonverbal working memory. The screens are making the pictures for us. The screens are giving us the pictures. They have eliminated the time of boredom when we use our imagination. When we used to all ride the bus home and stare out the window and visualize to ourselves and talk to ourselves, right? Now there's so many screens and instant gratification, we have these things making the pictures for us. And it is significantly delaying the skill of nonverbal working memory and the visual imagery signal. And of course, we live in this instant gratification world. So kids are constantly thriving on instant gratification. And what happens to your son, your daughter, after they've been on video games or they've been on TikTok for five, six hours? What happens afterwards? They're hot, yeah. They're they're unbelievably irritable, right? And why is that? Because nothing can stimulate their brain in the way that these, these games do. That's exactly what it is. They spend so much time in this infant gratification screen-based world, it completely depletes the brain of dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, vasopressin, all the all the pleasure thing, all the things that are brain that make us feel pleasure are completely depleted. So it's time for dinner. Uh, it's time to do homework after being on screen. It's not going to happen. Right? So instant gratification now, dysregulation later. Serenity now, there we go. That's what happened. The sign fell right next to Okay? Lack of varied experiences. So this screen based, you know, never before in this world has, has something come about where every kid has it and it's in their pocket on them 24 7. You know, back in the day, people blamed the radio for destroying society, blaming TV. But the real issue with phones, computers, it is on us 24 7, constantly vibrating, constantly beeping, constantly there, games on it, always there. And this has become the cool thing that kids are so drawn to, especially kids that have that disconnect. So it's created a lack of varied experiences if they want to be on these things all the time. A lack of true interpersonal relationships. Relationships have now also moved online. We're not going to hang out and do something over the weekend. We're going to play Smash Brothers together. We're going to play Minecraft together. And we'll talk through the headset. And the studies have shown that does not light up the parts of the brain that face-to-face -face interpersonal uh, social experiences do. So those online relationships, whether, whether it's on Snapchat, Discord, online video games, Minecraft, those are not social experiences. Those are not true social experiences that are better than you kids. So all of these screens have eliminated the time of boredom, the having to plan, having to problem solve, you know, high speed internet, Wi Fi, Google, right? How much of homework nowadays really isn't even testing the child's mastery of content? It's testing how good they are at Google. Think about that. This homework is literally testing this child. How good are you, how good are you at typing things into Google? Right? So this area has gotten so bad that they have now added screaming and screams and gaming disorder into the DSM. So gaming disorder is now listed in the DSM-5 and it's listed under these ideas. So more than one hour per day is associated with increased signs of inattention, consistent signs of increased opposition for the parents, Excessive release of dopamine in the brain while the baby leads to anger and isolation. Okay. So now we can start to talk about home and sex. Do you need me to go back? No. Okay. So now, <laughs> so, I'm always watching the cameras. So now we can start to look at, you know, in this screen based instant gratification world kids are growing up in. I think we can all comfortably say there has never been a harder time to be a parent, has there? There's never been a harder time to be a kid. Think about that. All of the like social media, mental health, anxiety, 
school, school stress, uh, all of these things, this is a really difficult time to be a parent and to be a child. Really, really stressful, really hard. And the more we focus on executive functioning principles, we can increase a lot of this mental health crisis that we're seeing. So in terms of parent coaching, you know, there are some things that parents can find themselves doing, you know, intentionally or unintentionally that could inhibit the development. These are just some of the things that we see time and time again. Sometimes parents may do tasks for their child that they are capable of doing independently, which can enable over-dependence. Constantly prompting them, making them prompt dependent on you to get things done. Lack of non-screen, free play, unstructured time, which we now know is the greatest way to build executive function skills through play, because executive functioning basically is mental play. All of that manual play, but we know when kids are young in preschool and kindergarten, what's the most important thing for those kids to do? Play, right? Why? Why is play so important? Creativity, imagination, purpose. All of those things. So basically what we now know is all of that manual play, executive skills go from external to internal. That's that motion, external to internal. Reliance on others to independence, right? Reliance on external things to motivate you, then you become internally motivated. Reliance on the world to tell you your emotions, then we can internalize our emotions and choose our own emotions. It's the same thing with play. All of that manual play kids do in younger ages goes to internal play, mental play. It's the transition to executive function that allows us to problem solve, plan, prioritize, come up with a plan B, plan C, all mental play, play never stops. Solving problems for your kid and in, in inhibiting development of independent problem solving, speaking for them, and micromanaging academic performance, telling them what they have to do for homework and reminding them to answer in, keeping them from dependent, right? So there's different, of course, there's different parenting styles, different things, but decades of research do show that the authoritative parenting style, which that name I hate completely, is the most effective style for raising productive well-adjusted functional children with ADHD. I refer to this as reciprocal parenting, 50-50, right? The parent does for the child, the child does for the parent, because there's competent roles within the house. It's not the child kind of running the show and choosing what to do. It's important to have expectation, structure, limits on the screen time, physical activity, and family time. It's a 50-50 competent role household. And the effect of competent roles on kids with ADHD, neurodiversity within the home, the research shows it is tremendous towards building self-confidence and self-worth uh, and really what it does overall for their independence, having them learn how to pack their own lunch, having them learn how to, you know, they to clean a certain area, they're in charge of laundry, they're in charge of garbage, they're in charge of planning for family night, whatever it may be, get creative. But when you create competent roles for your child, we're developing that reciprocal relationship. And here's just a great, this is part of the handout, just a great uh, uh, view of the difference from CNBC and, uh, of the different styles. So permissive parenting, child-driven, rarely gives or enforces rules, and overindulges the child to avoid conflict. So you know your child gets highly self-regulated very easily when they don't get their way, so we overindulge the child uh, to avoid conflict to the point where they kind of are setting their own rules. They're playing games whenever they want. This permissive parenting style tends to have open access to games and screens. And that's the big red flag when the Xbox is right there, the computer is right there, the switch is right there, the phone is right there, and there's no limits on them. It's open access. And parents say, why won't he do his homework? Why won't he go aside? Why won't he do that? Because the video games are right there. They're always going to choose those things in their environment over things that are new, challenging, or anxiety producing because they rarely do them. So authoritative parenting, which is a terrible name for it, is more democratic. Solve problems together with the child. Sets clear rules and expectations. Open communication and natural consequences. Responsive, reciprocal, high expectations. Flexible, democratic. <clears throat> So we can talk now about some of the behaviors that you may see in the home, right? So a big thing is this argument vortex, right? How many of you guys have been thrown into the argument vortex before? 
right? I have a two-year-old and I'm guilty of it. He always wants animal crackers and you can't have them. Too many animal crackers. Okay. So let's start to talk about this. Okay. Kids with ADHD are often highly skilled at this emotional manipulation of their parents. This gives them instant gratification, right? Emo like emotionally manipulating your child, uh, emotionally manipulating your parents is more instantly gratifying to them than going and doing homework. So they would, so their brain stimulates more towards getting into a five hour fight with you instead of doing 10 minutes of homework, right? So emotional manipulation is used in many ways. It's one of their tools in their toolbox, used to avoid non-preferred tasks, establishing a sense of control, gives them that dopamine rush of gratification. They try to get what they want with guilt and worry, just really emotionally manipulating you so they can stay in that comfort zone. So they will do whatever they can to stay in their comfort zone, which nine times out of 10, 10 times out of 10, times out of 10 is screens and isolation. But when they're asked to do something new, something challenging, something novel, like, hey, sign up for that fun Friday, sign up for that club, go, you know, go do homework club, go do this. And it's that instant no, 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 no. That's different ways for them to emotionally manipulate so they can stay in their comfort zone. So part of emotional manipulation is known as noise. It's a form of venting, which is normal. Everyone does it, but it's taken to extreme levels. It's a normal part of childhood normal part of adolescence, but it's taken to extreme levels. This is that constant complaining about uh, having to do a non-preferred task. This weekend, we're not going to play games. This weekend, we're not going to play screens. We're going to set up uh, a time for you to go over to your friend's house and play with them. Or I'm going to ask you to not come home from school on Friday. I want you to go do this, the fun Friday at the arcade or at the bowling alley, right? And the instant no, 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 and all the noise they use to avoid that non-preferred task. Or I'm asked for, I'm gonna sign you up for therapy. I'm gonna sign you up for counseling. I'm gonna sign you up for uh, the basketball team or the chess club, whatever it may be. This is their way to avoid that non-preferred task. And they can be relentless about starting an argument, explaining why they should get what they want. This is where that argument vortex comes in, where they want to see how much you are being emotionally reactive to them. That's their goal. This is negative attention seeking to the fullest. So the only thing they're really looking for here is to see mom and dad go from calm, chill, focus to upset, dysregulated, and angry. That's their goal. That's all they want is to see mom and dad change from calm to angry, and all the focus goes on that. So the examples, they say, no, that's stupid. No, I'm not doing that. With anything that's new or not instantly gratifying. So their goal is simply for you guys to respond to them. All they want is a response. All they want is for you guys to respond to that noise. But the noise does not require your response or attention. You know, part of parenting is you guys are the adults. You guys know what's best for them. Remember, ADHD is a disorder of self-awareness. They're not fully aware of their needs. They're not fully aware of what's best for them. You guys know what's best for them. You have always known what's best for them. And nobody has their best interest in mind more than you all, period. Right? That unconditional love, right? You guys know what's best for them. So when you hear this noise, you don't have to respond to it. You can tell them, this is what you're doing. This is what's happening. Come to me when you're ready. We can talk about it. But you do not have to respond to this regulation. You don't have to get sucked in to the argument vortex. You can... You know, put your foot down and uh, and let it be known what they're, what's happening. Can I? Yep. Yep. Um, maybe we'll touch on this more later, but obviously, the older the child gets, the stronger their will is, um, and the less you can force them to do things. So I'm certain sure you can probably see the natural consequences as the result. But mm -hmm. when your child says no and you need them to do things, like. Even like in the teenage years, like big shower. Yep. No. You know, how did how does I mean you can ignore it, but eventually like correct. <laughs> like, you know, you could be sick, like you're going to smell bad. You're gonna to go to school and people are gonna like how you smell. Yep. Sometimes they're like, I don't care. So I just wonder like 
and you don't, and it's very easy to get in that argument board right. It's very easy sure. to respond. Yep. And, and I just, any, any advice for that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, on that Say it. Can you repeat her question? So the, first, so the question is, of course, kids get older and they become more and more defiant. So sometimes it's not easy to have a young teenager when they're saying no, when they say, no, I'm not going to shower. You can walk away, ignore the noise, but they're simply just not going to do it. So this is where the structure in the home really comes in, the accountability. You know, when they are regulated, you're going to want to sit and talk to them about expectations, create some visuals, which are in that packet right there. Create some visuals of, you know, if then, um, if you do this, this may happen, and use a lot of if, if then language with them. If you choose not to shower, okay, you're also choosing to stay after school for homework club. You're also choosing to lose your Xbox, take your phone, those sorts of things. And we know that taking technology away is not always the most effective thing, but it's that natural consequence, right? So, and it's important for them to build that cause and effect. Because that's part of the reason why it's so ineffective taking screens away, because there isn't that cause and effect in their mind. So we have to change the language we use with them. Okay, you're choosing not to shower, you're also choosing to whatever the consequence is, right? So we have to be able to use that uh, right there. But as parents, you guys have to pick and choose your battles, right? You know, there's there's only so much back and forth argument vortex, and the argument vortex is never successful. You know, you're never going to get anything out of a dysregulated child, right? So you can ignore, you can walk away, but usually, typically over time, when they recognize, okay, mom and dad are not going to be emotionally reactive to my emotional reactivity, they start to recognize, hey, my toolbox, my bag of tricks really isn't working anymore. And all of the no, the yelling, the, you know, the FU mom, all that stuff, right? All that tends to fade away when they realize it's not working anymore. Kids are way smarter than we ever give them credit for. And kids do what works. And if they use noise, if they learn you learn, if they use learned helplessness, if they're if the argument vortex is working, they're going to keep doing it. So if they keep saying no, 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 I'm not going to shower and just uh, all of that noise and all of that trying to suck you in, but you model effective calmness and stay calm and don't respond to the noise. It's not going to happen overnight, but they're eventually going to recognize, hey, I don't have mom wrapped around my finger as I thought I did, right? And eventually they're going to start to recognize, you know, when it gets to the point where a friend might say to them, hey, you kind of smell pretty bad, right? <laughs> Something's going to happen that's eventually going to put them in the shower. What about kids who don't seem to care about consequences? Or is, that, uh, is that just a misnomer that there, is, there are consequences they all care about? Well, a lot of that is in the short term. A lot of that is, you know, I don't care about consequences right now. A lot of that is them putting that card up. You know, like all of us care about consequences. You know, these kids want their phone, they want their game, they want those things. But a lot of it is them using these tools in their toolbox. Let me show my parents that they can do whatever they want. I don't care. Because we as, we as parents, and it's all of us are guilty of this, at some point, you know, we get so emotionally reactive, we tend to give some empty threats, don't we? Right? We all do. We, have, we all do. You keep that up, you're losing this. You keep that up, you're losing that. And we get so damn exhausted. We have so much going on, we never follow through on it. All of us are guilty of that. Every parent in the history of this earth is guilty of that, right? And the kids kind of take note of that. They, oh, they threatened to do this. They threatened to do that. They're not going to follow through on that. They'll take my phone away, I'll get it back in a day. Right? It's all about consistency and focus on the long term. You know, if they go, you know, a couple of weeks and they realize the phone is gone, Xbox is gone, uh, you know, they, they sign me up for all these things after school, the bus isn't taking me home anymore, they're not picking me up. I have to, you know, uh, join these clubs, these sports, these different, these new things. I'm being put out of my comfort zone altogether. My comfort zone is basically gone. Eventually, they're going to come back and they're going to want to have a conversation about how things have changed. So they are presenting with a shield, their guard up, that consequences don't affect them, but they do in the long run, right? Learned helplessness, another tool in their toolbox, basically not completing an act, so we can all do it for them, acting passive until, until you do the task for them, making self-defeating comments, 
Uh, and it's really all about just trying to do as little as possible so that you can do it for them. So do not do things for your child. They can do on their own. Uh, one of the best ones, yep. One of the people online uh, shared that teachers too are guilty of that. Of what? Empty of, threats? Of not recognizing the, the those steps to kind of find the thing that triggers the student. Of course. Yeah, it's human. It's human. You know, that like all none of this is the blame. Game. And I'm standing up here as the ADHD executive function expert. I have a two-year-old who completely runs the house now. Right? <laughs> like, you know, and I'm Mr. Anti-Screen. I have about 20 pictures on my phone of her watching Elmo on my iPad. <laughs> and Miss Rachel. You guys know Miss Rachel? Oh, right, right. It's a huge on period of tour. Wow. So if you guys do not if you guys do not screen my daughter watch, I look like the biggest hypocrite in the world, right? <laughs> We're all guilty of this. There is nothing harder in the world than being a parent, period. And if your child is neurodiverse, it's even harder. There is qualitative studies done that having a child with ADHD is just as threatening as having a child with autism spectrum disorder, right? So having it's this this is difficult. It's hard. Raising a neurotypical child is hard, right? Because they're going to push for independence and they're going to do wild things. So none of this is the blame game. It's just education of okay, let me be a little bit more aware of these things. So I know I can regulate and model effective comments. So there is no such thing and has never been such thing as a parent. At the end of the day, we want our kids to be safe, happy, and healthy. Like I said before, success is subjective, right? We're all going to make mistakes, all of us. So one of the most important things to remember, one of the most helpful parent coaching tips is that language makes this regulation worse. One of our natural instincts as a parent is my child's dysregulated, he's yelling at me, he's cursing, he's fighting, he's elevated. Let me lecture him. Let me give him lots and lots of words. Let me use my profound adult speech to tell him what he's doing wrong and help him. Never works. Language makes dysregulation worse. You have to take a reset. Let them know, I see you're angry, I see you're frustrated, I see you're upset. Validate their feelings, as always. We never say feelings are bad. Validate their feelings and say, you know what? We can talk about this in an hour, two hours, 24 hours. Cooler heads prevail. Let's talk about this. And make this a practice and a habit in your house. Let's take a reset. I see you're upset. Let's take a reset. Let's go back to a state of calm. And it allows an opportunity to self-correct and learn from the experience. So always remember, language makes this regulation worse. So we're going, yep. Yes. <laughs> um, I tend to talk a lot <laughs> when Jacob was that, or anyone really, even these two. So I don't want to talk here, but to, tonight, Jacob actually really did good. He said something like, when you say calm down and I'm upset, it makes me like more upset. Yeah. 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 Which I, for, for a kid to say that, that's huge. It was so I mean, he was trying to keep himself together. So he's like shaking, trying to just say that without probably telling me to whatever else. Yeah. 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 So is it, I mean, the other day though, I had a success where I said, I need a break and I, I can't talk right now. And like, he did not know what to do because it was like, what do you mean? You're not, you know? And it was very hard because I always want to make sure he's yeah. okay because I'm yeah. nervous. Yeah. Is there, I mean, is it that literally like, can you like more take it to yourself and say, okay. like, I need a little you, time you to do what works. You do no parenting advice is one size fits all. If that works for you and your family and your child, do it 100%. The most important thing to remember is that if your kid is dysregulated, any language period is going to make that dysregulation worse, period. And especially if you're dysregulated as a parent, a dysregulated adult has never calmed down a dysregulated parent. That's never happened. Yeah, I mean, right. So um, when you say not like, would it be then when you are, when you're both ready to have the conversation, set the expectation of when this gets like out of whack? When I'm silent now is because it's not going to help you and it's not going to help me. Like yeah. I literally and just tell them, and, and that's what you're literally and telling. To you know to validate their feelings, how they're feeling. I know you're upset about losing your Xbox. I know you're upset about losing your phone, whatever it may be. I see that. I get it. I respect it. But right now, I need a break. Let's take a reset. 
Let's talk about this. And sometimes you get the time frame. Let's talk about this in 12 hours, in 24 hours. Let's take a break. Cooler heads prevail. I'm going to go do what I do to self soothe. You do what you need to do to self soothe. We will have this conversation, just not right now. And it's, it's all about just presenting it, and you take that reset. Yep. So I have younger children, so they're nine and almost seven year old. And what do you do? Because I, I feel like there's this natural response if my nine year old is in, you know, whatever instigates or push it, you know, it's whatever to my younger child. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, apologize to your sister. Or did you give this instant? No, I'm not doing, you know, how do you, you know, with younger children, uh -huh. you know, let's listen with certain kinds of it's just him. Like, I will give him that space to calm down and then I understand it. and he uses the time before bed and will be open and calm and he needs that. So how are you in a situation to like, I don't think an advocate for your child or that school, right? Like yeah. so your child's fighting with another kid at school and it's like, you know, you need to apologize to Lauren. Like, you know, yeah. you made her cry and your kid's like, I'm not doing it. We're like, in two hours, we'll understand. Like, I shouldn't have done this to my sibling or I shouldn't have done this to my friend Lauren. Like, right. the younger kids, like, how do you give them that sort of space? Yep. So what the research shows about that, yep. So the question is, is in, in the heat of the moment, uh, when a kid is doing something mean to a sibling or a kid at school, and it's the parent's reaction of you did this, you need to apologize in the moment, you know, what to do in what to do in that situation. So what the research shows with that is kids' apologies really are basically kind of meaningless. So kid, I'm I'm sorry. They either say I'm sorry to move on, or they see it as a, an opportunity to be defiant and get negative attention seeking. So this whole you did this, we need to apologize right now, really doesn't work in the long term. So what you can do, or you know, whatever, is just basically state out loud, you did this, it made this person feel this way, and then you do something called a cleanup. So you mentioned earlier, you know, later on, you know, in the day, a couple of hours later, they do recognize, oh, I did do something wrong because they're more regulated than in that social context. So later on, instead of having them apologize, have them say something nice or do something nice for that person. So they're doing an actual cleanup. So they can, you know, very quickly, depending on the age, just compliment the person or, you know, sit with them or play a game with their choosing uh, or whatever it may be. So this whole I'm sorry thing is something that our us adults have kind of pushed on kids and it's good. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's, 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 it, it means nothing. It means nothing. They either say it out loud and move on, or they say it, or they'll say, no, I'm not saying it because they have a power struggle. So wait till later and do a cleanup where you can remind them, hey, earlier you kind of brought these feelings in. That's what happens. Yep. One of the virtual listeners uh, asked, do you have any tips for people who have aphantasia mind blind? They lack the ability to visualize. What should they use as an alternative if they don't have the ability to recall or visualize? If you don't have a quick answer, I've already mentioned that we can email them. So that is a so very, very common question. Yes. There's lots of uh, controversy uh, and debate about aphantasia. I hear about that all the time. Uh, I would strongly recommend that person dive deeper and get a deeper, uh, uh, deeper evaluation. You know, having aphantasia is basically your brain is not able to hold any image you want. You can't hold an image. It's like almost like a like an aphasia, like like what Bruce Willis has, like an aphasia where you can't like uh, hold an image at all. If that's really true, where you have that aphantasia, that's unbelievably debilitating, and that's hard to function minute by minute by minute. So there's a very good chance that person has ADHD, executive functioning challenges. Something happens. So dive deeper, get a deeper evaluation because aphantasia is really really serious. And it's mostly due to a TBI. Uh, so that person should definitely dig deeper because advantageous is uh, a very serious thing. Advantage of. Yeah. Cool. Nice. So, in terms of uh, executive functioning strategies in the home, uh, Dr. Russell Barkley's favorite quote is act, don't yet, right? Decrease that language. Language makes this regulation worse. If you're going to do something, act, no conversation about it walk away. Use that cause and effect language. You chose to hit your brother. You chose to do no homework. You chose to say those incredibly mean things to me. You also choose to chose to lose your Xbox. You chose to lose your Switch. You chose to lose your phone. And if your child is below the age of 18 
and they live in your home, they live under your roof, that phone, that Xbox, that Switch, that PlayStation, you're hearing it now, those are yours, not your child's, okay? You now have permission to understand those things are yours, okay? I don't want to hear that's mine, that's mine. They're yours, okay? They live in your house, they're yours. You guys have the right to take them away at any time. They don't need them to survive, okay? Know when something is negative attention seeking, and remember, kids thrive off of that back and forth. They get, get such infant gratification and such dopamine rush when they recognize, hey, I pissed my parents off. It's never their goal. They don't wake up in the morning and say, man, I'm going to piss off my parents today. But the opportunity comes and they see they made their parents go from calm to angry. That's a dopamine rush for them. It's their goal <clears throat> to elevate parents and avoid non referred tasks. If they can go an entire day, and make sure this is their day, they follow their goal. So ask yourself, what does your child do every day besides these three things? Is manipulation not an executive functioning skill? Uh, it is not an executive functioning skill. No, 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 it is yeah. not. That's a, that's, that's a, 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 it just seems like a pretty skill. It, they are matches at it. They're matches at lots of things. You know, you know the, the ADHD brain is capable of unbelievable things. You know, it really, you know, this 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 uh, brain difference, this neurodiverse population, uh, they're amazing. What they're fully capable of when they're hyper focused on something and they use their creativity, uh, these are these are the true pioneers of this earth, like unbelievable people that can that are going to change this world for the better long term. Uh, but the manipulation piece is part of you know anxiety driven. It's self regulation driven. And they want their they want to stay in their comfort zone as much as possible because think about this: something the ADHD brain really really hates is a learning curve, right? So these kids that their brains get so hyped and so focused on instant gratification, they can't stand anything that has a learning curve. If they're not good at it the first time they try it, that's it. I'm done. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Because starting something new involves a delay. And these kids can't deal with delays. They're growing up in the world of screens, Amazon same day delivery, Google. There's no more waiting for the weekend to go to Toys R Us or Best Buy to get your video game. It downloads from the internet onto the hard drive of the system the second it comes out. This is not a world of boredom and a world in a world of waiting anymore. So if something has a learning curve, and it takes time to gain confidence and confidence. That's it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it in soccer game because I'm not going to be good at it. I'm not going to be the best. Question? How do you avoid bribery when trying to provide a reward? Is a question from all of you. Uh, you, you simply do not, you don't get into that negotiation. You be the parent, you be that authoritative parent, you step into your parental authority. This is what I'm saying. You're going to do this, or this is going to happen. That if then thinking or when then when you do this this happens and of course master manipulators oh but if I do this then I can get this right so kids are always going to try to drive because it makes them feel good but you don't have to have that discussion that's when you say this conversation is over we had the discussion you can use some of the worksheets I provided for you to make a visual of it but that's it do not get something with the driver that's basically the argument for this yes. So we have a son who just turned 18 and he was only diagnosed with ADHD probably a year ago. Uh -huh. And we did all the things on the first couple of screens. We've been to the counselors that said do this, this, this. Yep. I guess my concern is that like is it realistic to think that over the next year or two we can change the thinking, change the change our way of doing things. Um new school and all of that before he goes out into the world and is on his own. So so what so I, is it realistic that in this short period of time because we were diagnosed so late because we, we are just kind of diving into all of this mm -hmm. now that he'll will be able to make enough change for him to go out and all the learned behaviors in the past. Mm -hmm. So the number one thing you're going to want to focus on in a short amount of time is varied experiences. 
So that's basically what college is, varied experiences, right? So we've seen in this country with the screen-based world, lack of varied experiences, lack of interpersonal relationships, kids in public schools with 200 page IEPs, uh, 504 with every accommodation in the book, uh, and we're, we're heavy focus on academic scores, no focus on social, social, emotional, and mentorship like Bill talked about so well, right? And now, over the past five years, America now leads the entire world in first semester college dropouts because there's such a massive change from 12th grade of you know uh, kids that have you know there's kids at IEPs and Chicago fours that are top of the class. And they get into these colleges because they have the grades, they have the academics, but then they go to college and they don't know how to respond to their parents to their teachers' emails. They don't know how to set office hours. They don't realize that study hall is not ingrained in their schedule. They have to recognize when they have work to do and go to the library and do the work themselves. And there's no structured time to meet people. They kind of have to go to the dining hall themselves and introduce themselves to others. So they're kind of sitting in their room, playing video games, watching YouTube videos, and everything's falling apart. And they have the IQ, they have the academics, but they're not doing those skills. So what you're going to want to do in this period of time is really create pretty rigid structure in your home to make sure that it's not this on a daily basis. Go to school, come home, stay home. You're going to want to look to maybe get them a part-time job. Sign them up for every single fun Friday there is. Get them into the homework club. Get them joining, you know, all the great work, you know, all the great clubs that you know Miss Gillespie does and all that the Hill Talks do. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you know, Miss Gillespie, you know, Miss Gillespie does an unbelievable job. And, all, and uh all the different counselors and everybody get them involved in the community, do some volunteer work, you know, get them out with friends. Uh, uh what's the age? He's 18. 18, yeah. He's a border upstairs. Oh, I think all the things you're saying are. Yeah, so the boarding program here, the boarding program here is amazing. So they do with Miss Tompkins and everybody out there. So the fact that you're doing the boarding program, that is a huge, huge step towards success in college. So you know, doing that and being successful there, there's a very good chance that you sound like you're doing a lot of the right things. So yeah, so very experienced. But the boarding program here is second to none. Yep. My I'm curious because it's kind of something that's now in the public schools. I mean, so we have the advantage of being here, and I really appreciate this information. Um, so, is it is it's a new way of thinking just in general to shift to like public schools and you know, does it expect you to function? Yeah, are yeah, they are they focusing on these things in general not, and the education? Not, not in the slightest. Okay. Unless they bring in an outside person to uh, to train the staff on executive functions, then it's really never worked out. You know, public schools might start like an executive functioning lab, but that's going to be more of what I talked about earlier, cleaning out backpacks and organizing folders, and sitting with kids while they work. The, the teachers there simply aren't trained. The, the teachers aren't trained. It's not their fault. Mm -hmm. You know, teachers are, you know, overworked and burned out and that, that you know, can pay so little at first. But it's really just not part of their training and part of their program. So unless they bring an outside person in to train them, executive functions are not going to be a part of it. And these schools are uh, there's lots of pressures on schools to, like, to really get because teachers now their performance is based on their classes' performance on standardized tests, right? So teachers' performance is graded on how well their class did on the keystone tests and those sorts of things. So teachers are now forced to constantly teach to the test where they can't be creative, they can't do project-based learning, they can't, you know, make learning fun. It's this lecture listen model of American education where the teacher lectures, the kids listen, they take the test, they regurgitate the information onto the test, they forget everything two hours later, then it's on to the next topic, right? It's an absolute mess. There's no executive functioning in school unless they bring in an outside person. Uh, and I would say that's especially true for many of the public schools in this area. Personally, that's my my personal life. Yep. So, like I said earlier, varied experiences. If you, if you take anything away from this training, number one, it's language makes this regulation worse, and number two, varied experiences. And this is part of why I love Hilltop so much. It's because activity period, mentor period, recess. The dorm, fun Fridays, uh, uh, the gaming club, uh, the, the VR club, whatever it is, 
uh, everything that they do here. You know, that there's disc golf all over the campus. They have a huge soccer field, the, the uh, gym class, everything. What this pool does here to provide unique, varied experiences, no other school that I work with is doing. So this right here is huge. And this is part of the reason why I see kids that do want to stay in their comfort zone. You know, that's one thing that I love so much about the school. I'll work with kids that start here brand new from a public school or from another private school. And I see them build such unbelievable relationships. That is like the most heartwarming, amazing thing that I love about Hilltop is you find these kids that, you know, they're totally awkward, they're quirky, they're on their phone a lot, they really only talk about certain things, but they really build real friendships here. It's amazing. And you see it here, right here in this room, right here outside, they're really getting to know each other, they care about each other, they're checking in on each other, they're laughing and smiling. It just creates such a safe environment and the kids here really feel safe. And it's the idea of, it's not just a school, it's a community that provides varied experiences. And that is just so important. So of course we want to teach habituation, uh, systematic desensitization, exposure therapy. We've got to get kids out there. They're going to say no. They're going to say, no, mom, I'm not doing homework club. No, mom, I'm not doing a fun Friday. No, I'm not signing up for the soccer team. No, I'm not doing the golf game. But we've got to push them into it. And nine times out of 10, 10 times out of 10, when it's over, they're going to say, I'm glad you made me do that. Okay, so we're building resiliency. And what we have to remember is that we're teaching kids to, and, uh, uh, to stay strong and for parents, stay strong in the short term because we're focused on long term success. Yes, your child's going to be anxious. Yes, they're going to be nervous. Yes, they're going to have lots of noise. Yes, they're going to yell at you because you're pushing them out of their comfort zone. You're trying to give them varied experiences. Uh, you're, you're changing the way that daily life looks like. So we're staying strong in the short term, persevering through those behaviors. If you use that packet there and finally decide to implement some screen time structure in your home, if you're one of those open access people and you want to have more screen time structure, there's going to be massive behaviors in the beginning when you sit down with your kid and say, hey, it's only going to be an hour or two of games a day, and you're going to do more things. You need to stay short in the stay strong in the short term and focus on the long term success. That's what it's all about. I have never worked with a family that decreased screen time and ended up regretting it. Yep. Okay. So when you are successful in bringing your child out of a comfort zone, they try something they haven't before and it doesn't go badly. Even if it doesn't go great, what if they doesn't go bad? Mm -hmm. um, because they have such challenges with working memory and remembering that next time, yep. I, I do always try to say, remember this. Yeah. But what else can you do like so that they can make, is there something you can do to make those connections? Like yeah. People, when they're trying to next time, you can say, remember when, or you were successful at this, or... Well, a lot of that is this. So we always want to remember to praise effort and not ability, right? So all of that language you use when you see them being successful at a non-preferred task. So the most important thing that we have, that kids internalize the most is the feeling, right? So it's a lot of, oh, you had fun doing this, you had fun doing that. But if we can get them to internalize the feeling they had when they joined that club, they did that non-preferred thing, like really figure out how it made them feel, that sort of thing. If you happen to be able to get pictures of them doing it, even better, you have those visuals. But the most important thing that kids remember is how things made them feel. Okay. So if they do a, a certain task, they hated it first, they persevere through it, and then they get to the end, they have to remember how they felt. So anything that you can do to praise that effort that they use and then how they felt at the end, remember that feeling. Uh, maybe you can even record them talking about how awesome it was. You know, make a video of them saying, hey, I joined the baseball team. I ended up liking it. Hey, I joined the golf team. I ended up liking it. Make a recording of them, get pictures of them, but really focus on the feeling. It's not so much, you did it. It was fun. Great. Good job. Because kids hear that all the time, right? Good job, man. You did it. Great. All that kind of stuff. It's really get them, ask some reflexive questions to get them to talk about how it made them feel. And that's what's going to drive them to repeat that independently without any problems. So it's all based on the feeling. Okay. 
So remember all the work we're doing here with executive functions, everything is all about quality of life. That's all we care. Success is subjective, but the most important thing we care about with our students is improving their quality of life and their positive self-worth. And all of these things, language, social, executive functions, resiliency, all of those things go towards improving quality of life. Do you guys have a copy of the executive function grown out plan? Look through that. If you have any questions, please email me. I'll be happy to walk you through it. Uh, I'm a big fan of my friend ADHD dude and his parent training membership site. Him and I have a very similar philosophy on all of these things. So definitely check that out. It does great work on that. And of course, here's all my information. Uh, so you have my email, my website, my Instagram, my, my personal cell phone number. I always love to keep in touch with people that take time out of their night, especially when I talk for way too long and keep you guys here super late. So please keep in touch with me if you have any questions about the packet, about your child, a question that wasn't answered tonight. I love chatting with parents. I, I'm on the phone way too much. Please use this information. Reach out to me. Say, hey, Mike, I like your presentation. I have an extra question. Reach out to me. I want to be there for you guys. If you want to talk to I want to also reinforce what he said. So as someone who raised two teenagers, one of whom was the princess of executive function or dysfunction, uh, we used to call it, some of you may have heard me say, we used to call the backpack the Bermuda Triangle. And brilliant, brilliant young woman who actually just arrived on the train um, to spend the next couple of days here and is very successful now, brilliant kid, but used to drive us crazy and kind of reinforcing what Mike said, talk less, use a few words, consequences, don't back down. I had a spouse that when I would say, if you do this, you are going to lose this privilege for three days or a week. Sometimes I would do three weeks, I was tough. <laughs> she would give it back to her a couple of days later. But I always said, I'm going to say this once. You are going to lose this privilege if you do such and such. If you even say one word, you will lose it. She'd say, but, and I'd say, that was the word. You now lost it for one full week, and I wouldn't respond after that. Or I would say, you have 10 minutes to stop doing what you're doing, or you will lose this privilege. And at the end of 10 minutes, that privilege was gone, and I would walk away. I also would never argue. I would never raise my voice. And I would make eye contact and just stare her down. And she knew this. And it worked. And all of the coaching really works. And the thing is, having worked at the college level for decades, if you don't do this, he's right. And what happens is, week five in college, it all falls apart. All falls apart week five, because what they do in high school and what they learn, and when they go to college, it's two completely different worlds. And you have to be a parent. You're not their best friend. Mm -hmm. Please don't tell me you're their friend or you're their best friend. <clears throat> you're not your parents. You have to act like it. You have to set boundaries. It's tough. You don't want to be tough, you shouldn't have kids. <laughs> Nobody said it was easy. Right? right? It's too late now. <laughs> I hope this was helpful. A couple of quick things for you. We have two other presentations coming up in March and in April. Um, in your packet, there's also a list of um, upcoming events. There's some other things coming up. Um, there is also information on the summer program. We have a great summer program that we're gearing up for. Mr. Scribner back there is doing the East Fork, which is going to be phenomenal. For those who don't know it yet. Yeah, after talking about screen time. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's, it's East Fork is very good. The East Fork over here is the next And the facility we have over there, we're blowing it out and redoing it. Um, we're also doing some a lot of other projects coming up. Uh, we have some great, exciting things coming up in the next couple of months. Um, we also have some great needs. So I wouldn't, I'd be remiss if I didn't put in a plug uh, 
for Michelle over there, but we have a wish list that we sent out. We're sending out again. If anybody has contacts for different things that can help supplement our programming, please watch for it. We're going to be sending it out soon. She's like a blue light. <laughs> so we're having a blue light special. <laughs> uh, so enjoy. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. You know, it's a difficult night. Go home. Be tough. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My name is Christine. Hi, Christine. 